Ladies and gentlemen, I am John Pace, a member of the R.M. Santilli Foundation and the chairman of the World Lecture Series on Hadronic Mathematics, Mechanics, and Chemistry. It is a pleasure and honor for me to present Professor Ruggiero Maria Santilli in delivering Lecture 1D, which is perhaps the most difficult lecture of this series, on the identification of the limitations of Einstein's gravitation and general relativity. I indicated previously the difficulties of the preceding lectures on the limitations of special relativity, quantum mechanics, and quantum chemistry. These difficulties are magnified for the case of general relativity due to the unfortunate suppression of a true scientific process in the field because serious technical objections published in refereed journals have been mostly ignored by researchers in the field for about one century. Rather than accepting them or dismissing them also in refereed scientific journals. In fact, Professor Santilli has been the victim of rather serious obstructions by organized interests on Einstein's theories for over 30 years. These obstructions have been documented, reported, and denounced by the International Committee on Scientific Ethics and Accountability in their website, www.scientificethics.org. No serious understanding of this lecture can be achieved, not even minimally, without first addressing basic issues of ethics and accountability by high-ranking members of the organized interests on Einstein's theories. In this important lecture, Professor Santilli reviews three groups of technical objections on Einstein's gravitation and general relativity. First, the historical objections published soon following the appearance of general relativity. Second, physical objections on Einstein's conception of gravity. And third, rather serious geometric incompatibilities of the field equations with the Freud identity of the Riemannian geometry as well as the electromagnetic origin of the gravitational field. The understanding of this lecture additionally requires a technical knowledge of the new space-time symmetries presented in the lectures of level 3 and their experimental verifications presented in the lectures of level 5. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Santilli for the delivery of the most difficult and therefore the most important lecture of this series. Ladies and gentlemen, as stated by our chairman uh, John Pace, this is the most diffic difficult lecture of this series. So therefore I had to select uh, um, an appropriate uh, location where to deliver this lecture. Let me state very bluntly that to deliver a lecture on the limitation of Einstein general relativity in any um, qualified academic institution in, uh, in the United States of America or most of Europe is totally outside reality, as um, it will be documented in the, uh, um, progressively throughout uh, this lecture. So I had to select um, a receptive uh, environment among a number of uh, very receptive uh, uh, countries, such as Greece, that is, is very open to basic knowledge, I selected Egypt because of my attachment and my, my love of um, uh, Egyptian uh, ancient uh, civilization. You may have seen the, the view of the Luxor Temple in, uh, in the introductory part. The, however, look at the date. This is uh, January 29. This uh, we initiated the lecture when, uh, jointly with the initiation of um, of the, the Egyptian revolution. And uh, indeed, the Luxor Temple was empty, as you may have seen, while well, in reality it's full of, um, of thousands and thousands of tourists. The reason it was empty because there were military tanks uh, patrolling the streets nearby. To make a long story short, we were um, evacuated by the Belgian government because our flight originated from Brussels. We were treated by the Belgian government with b white gloves and five stars hotels and things like that. I want to say thanks to the um, Belgian government. It was really a privilege to be part of their, 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 um, their action. The, but as a result of all this, uh, the lecture had to be restarted and we had to redo completely in the United States of America, and, uh, in, in, in particular in, in Florida. 
Well, the, the, let me begin by stating the obvious. The Albert Einstein uh, has entered in, uh, in the history of science for many reasons. An additional reason is that he has been the first to initiate a geometric study of gravitation. Additionally, he selected uh, a geometry, the Riemannian geometry, which is simply fascinating. And this has a ma mathematical beauty that is undeniable, I, uh, as proven by the, by the fact that um, Einstein's general relativity and gravitation have attracted a large number of pure mathematicians, applied mathematicians, and theoretical physicists, including myself. And this has been going on for uh, close to a century, 96 years in, to be exact. After having said so, I have, to, uh, I have to make a blunt statement. After studying for 50 years the consistency and the various aspects of, of general relativity and, and in general and Einstein's conception of gravitation in particular, my conclusion is that um, the, the, those theories are fundamentally flawed and they have a, an unresolvable basic inconsistency, insufficiency, and short uh, shortcomings. I've tried for years to salvage, to salvage, to, the, to resolve the problems that we will be addressing during this lecture and fail. You reach a point in which we have, as a scientist, we have to admit the truth to the best of our knowledge. Okay, at that point, um, uh, as is, uh, is also known, I have, um, I have been dubbed um, with all sorts of names. Uh, as um, uh, as uh, this, what I'm ab about to say is fringe science and so on. There was also an editor when I published papers of, um, of appraising the limitations of Einstein's general relativity. There was an editor, I have never heard this name, who felt compelled to send um, a long email all over all over the academic world, claiming Santilli is a nuclear physicist. <laughs> of course, I, I've written a number of papers in nuclear physics, but I'm an applied mathematician. And then, um, th then the theorems that you will see in a moment, um, in a few moments, the, the theorems were um, disproved by, by a tangentially epistemological and philosophical aspect. So let me make uh, another s blunt statement to people such as this uh, unmentionable editors. I have been for several years a member of the Department of Mathematics of Harvard University under several grants from the Department of Energy. Therefore, I am fully qualified to express a judgment on the Riemannian geometry as well as on, the, on general relativity and Einstein conception of gravitation. Needless to say, I'm not expecting you to agree. This is not the issue. It's a question that I am sufficiently qualified, so therefore my objection, published in an independent, <laughs> severely refereed journal, should be considered if we don't want to pass the boundary from science into politics. Very well. Let's, um, let's begin with, um, with an analysis of the most fundamental uh, insufficiency. Those are not inconsistencies, insufficiency and, uh, of um, Einstein uh, general relativity. The first one is that uh, after a one century of attempt in, in the river of public, mon public money, it has been impossible to identify a, um, a, a consistent quantum version of gravitation. We now know the technical reason for because uh, because the Riemannian uh, geometry is necessarily uh, non-canonical in structure since it is a deformation of the Minkowska geometry. So therefore any operator image of, uh, of Einstein gravitation must necessarily be non-unitary. The non-unitary quantum theories are known to be um, catastrophically inconsistent when formulated with the mathematics of, the, um, of unitary theory, Hilbert spaces, etc. This, um, this catastrophic inconsistency I uh, studied in details in lecture 2a, 2b, 3c, etc. So there's no point in reviewing them here. Nevertheless, you know, this has been a major loss to science, namely the, the absence of a, 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 at least an operator form of gravity. It is a major insufficiency that has to be kept in, in mind by physicists 
an observer in good faith. The next insufficiency is that also after um, uh, close to a century of attempts, uh, in, in reality was, were initiated by Albert Einstein himself, general relativity has prohibited any consistent grand unification of electroweak and gravitational interactions. We know nowadays that uh, by, by, by following the historical conception of gravitation by Einstein, there is no hope whatsoever <coughs> of achieving a consistent uh, grand unification for many, many reasons. Just to flash um, a, a couple, the um, electroweak interactions are a magnificent theory verifying a symmetry, a universal symmetry, the Poincaré symmetry. Gravitation has no symmetry, has a covariance. The moment you match cova a covariant theory with Poincaré invariant theory, ladies and gentlemen, you have a, an horrendous mean strone that uh, the, the outcome can only be catastrophically inconsistent. Also, the mixing of a theory um, formulated on, on, on a curved space, which is non unitary, matched with the theory which is beautifully formulated on Minkowski space, you end up with another minestrone which has no, no chance, of, no realistic chances of success. The, um, the reason, uh, technical reason for the failure actually is an impossibility of achieving a consistent, there are all sorts of political grand unified the theory, but um, it, it, uh, one that really can uh, resist the test of time is impossible and we know many, many technical reasons. Additional reason for um, the, um, the fundamental limitation of Einstein gra gravitation is the um, complete absence of any poss even a possibility of formulating the gravitational field of antimatter. The reason is known, but not spoken in the best PhD courses, whether in Cambridge, USA or in Cambridge, England. And the reason that, that, um, that uh, uh, the only conjugation in, uh, in, gra in Einstein gravitation is that for the charge. But bodies, <laughs> astrophysical bodies, uh, have to be assumed generally to, uh, to, have, um, to be chargeless, to be neutral. Assuming they have a little charge, the contribution of a little charge <laughs> to, to the gravitational fields of a, a massive star, and an antimatter star is zero, virtually zero. So therefore, it is an intrinsic insufficiency of the theory. Those problems have been addressed. Uh, uh, I spent many decades of my life to, uh, to try to attempt the resolution of those process, of those insufficiency. I did achieve a preliminary solution, but I had to depart from Einstein gravitation. This is presented in, in this monograph, which has been published by Springer, one of the best publishers scientific publisher these days and uh, because I'm on the continuous ac accusation by, by equivocal uh, scientists in gravitation until he publishes idea in a journal in which he is the editor-in-chief. This is not the case. That the more before accepting this monograph, Springer started submitted to, to, to referee in, th in three continents and it was accepted with no, no modification. Then, um, the study of this monograph, which is available as a free PDF download because it's no longer uh, available in the original printed form, I believe is uh, necessary for an understanding of the rest of, of this lecture. Very well, I have divided this lecture into uh, five parts that deals with um, more detailed uh, um, critical examination of Einstein general relativity and gravitation. The first, um, oh, incidentally, all those objections that I am, I am presenting are unresolved. Namely, they've been published in referee journals, a variety of referee journals, by a variety of authors, not only by myself, but all they remain totally ignored by the so-called establishment in gravitation. Therefore, creating very serious problem of scientific ethics and accountability that must be addressed if we really care about uh, the, uh, the, our country and if we care about knowledge. It should be rem and, um, always be kept in, in mind that this uh, manipulation of science, such as um, complete ignorance of, um, of inconsistency by other scientists in the fields, this type of, of, uh, of equivocal scientific acts are perpetrated under public support by U United States taxpayers. So therefore, the last section indeed is dedicated to a clear addressing of these ethical issues in the field 
without which the consideration of basic insufficient insufficiency of Einstein gravitation will just be <laughs> will just be a farce, ladies and gentlemen. Will not absolutely be, you know, not worth even the consideration. I always uh, stated in my writing that no basic issue in science could be nowadays be considered unless we consider jointly issue pertaining to scientific ethics and, and accountability. For reasons that will be clear during this, um, this lecture. So the first unresolved um, issue that I want to bring to your attention, are, uh, I call them historical, of historical character. They, are, um, they appeared immediately after the proposal by Albert Einstein of, uh, of uh, his theory of gravitation. Then in the middle of the past century, there were additional unresolved, unaddressed, in the insufficiency, actual inconsistency of physical character. And then there were additional inconsistency of geometrical character more recently. And then finally there has been um, uh, uh, theorems of inapplicability of Einstein gravitation for interior gravitation that they have established this point beyond any possible doubt or any credible doubt. Very well, <coughs> let's start with um, part one. The, the original historical unaddressed and unresolved in, in insufficiency or inconsistency, if you want. The first one uh, relates to the bending of light, which was the birth of, um, of Einstein gravitation, as we all know. The, this is a pictorial view of the, the, the idea of the bending, and uh, this is one of the consequences, the so-called lens effect. The, issue, the first issue that we have to address here is the bending of light real or not? Does it exist in reality or not? The answer is absolutely yes. The existence of the bending of light is beyond any doubt. Here is just two of a large variety of evidence. Here you can see is an astrophysical object. In, 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 the, in the back there is a star, but we don't see the star. We, but but um, th th this halo of light means that there has been a bending of light from the from the back to us we can observe also this bending and um, at sunrise and sunset in any case with it is a visual uh, it, it, it is a visual evidence that we um, this is the ver verification of the halo of uh, due to the lensing effect very well so the issue is now how do we interpret this physical evidence now as you know einstein proposed the interpretation of uh, this phenomenon by the curvature of space he essentially said that this, is, uh, this bending of light is evidence that space is actually curved. And said if, if we are, uh, since uh, space is actually curved, so Einstein said, then we need a geometry that represents curvature uh, as a necessary condition to represent the bending. And therefore, among all the geometry, he selected Riemannian geometry. This process is well known. What are the object historical objections that are unresolved? The first historical objection is that the bending of light is, of, uh, is um, entirely of uh, Newtonian character to such an extent that, um, that uh, there is no need whatsoever of introducing curvature for the representation of the bending of light. So the argument is essentially the following, that Newtonian gravitation is universal, is admitted by everybody to be universal. Once you admit that Newtonian gravitation is universal, you must also admit that it attracts light. If for some reason uh, the, the light escapes Newtonian attraction, ladies and gentlemen, we have to rewrite four centuries of science since the, uh, since the um, beginning with the, the, um, the historical script by Newton. Now, people say, oh, Dr. Santilli does not understand gravitation. That's what they normally do because they don't have a technical argument. So they got into this step. So, and what they say is, is ludicrous because they say, oh, but, but um, um, Newtonian attraction is expressed in terms of masses and, uh, and um, gravity, uh, light has no mass. Since the light has no mass, they say, therefore is not attracted, but uh, does not, uh, is not part of Newtonian attraction. And um, this, type of, um, this type of objection, when proffered by, by expert, they are in indication of a very equivocal posturing. Why? Because it is well known by expert to qualify as such that the origin of the gravitational field is the energy and not the mass. Indeed, there is no mass momentum tensor. It doesn't exist. 
Well, the, the tensor exists is the energy momentum tensor. And that is the source of the gravi gravitational fields in any decent uh, level of treatment. So therefore, if, since uh, the energy is the origin of the gravitational field, is um, the, part of the mechanism of attraction, I have always written Newton's equation in their identical form, no change whatsoever, in which I write the energy instead of the masses, and I, um, I rescale the, the gravitational constant. This is an identical reformulation. But then the representation of the bending of light is trivial, because one of the two energies says the rest the energy of Jupiter, and the other is the, um, is the energy of, uh, of a light beam, as you know, as everybody knows, is a canyon, namely the, according to Einstein formula. So th this point is a very, this objection is very, very serious because uh, it goes at the very, very root of the conception of gravity as being characterized by an actual curvature of space because it's established that there is no need of an actual, uh, at least this is a very consistent treatment. It represents numerically the experimental evidence without curvature, actual curvature of space. As such, if we ignore it, ladies and gentlemen, we exit from, um, we exit from, uh, from uh, science and we enter into politics. I, I'm not claiming necessarily that this, uh, this argument is, uh, is correct. Maybe it has some flow on its own. That's not the point. The point is the suppression of, the, um, of, the, of debating this, uh, the, this historical objection. So I challenge my colleagues at Princeton University or at Cambridge USA or at Cambridge uh, England to, um, to, to, to debate whether this is correct or false. And I challenge them jointly with, um, jointly with the debate of other aspects that they will, will see. If they do not want to debate, then I, I, I recommend them not to use uh, public funds from the American uh, taxpayer for personal theologies. Because that will be a violation of our law, it will be abuse of public funds. It's just that simple. Now, let's see what happens with, um, uh, with, uh, with the representation, with, uh, with um, Einstein representation of the curvature of space. Ladies and gentlemen, it is based on a chain of assumption. There are seven independent assumptions to achieve indeed, and then after seven assumptions, you do indeed achieve a representation of, uh, of the bending of light with the curvature. Yes, you do at the end. But the problem is that each and every one of those assumptions is debatable, as you will see in the, the rest of the, this lecture. Let's start with the first assumption. Those are the ba basic equation of Einstein uh, gravitation, uh, representing its very, very, the very essence of his conception of gravitation. Namely, the reduction of gravitation to pure curvature with no sources. Look at here on the right hand side, there is zero. And uh, now, immediately at this point, the equivocal physicists will say, oh, this is until he does not understand, does not know that you can put on the right hand side. You can, uh, there are also source term, uh, source tensor on the right hand side when the, the body is charged. Ladies and gentlemen, when that uh, objection is moved, it's equivocal. It's equivocal. Because Einstein was Einstein. This we are talking about, uh, the, for instance, the gravitational fields of the sun that has an enormous mass. The source term, uh, tensor on the right hand side is for the potential charge of the sun. Let's assume that the sun is indeed charged and we can measure. But then, ladies and gentlemen, the contribution of the charge to the gravitational field of the sun is 10 to the minus 40. It's 0 0.0040 before you see a contribution. Just mentioning that there are, there are in this argument that there are source terms due to the charge is corruption. Either it's total lack of any technical knowledge or corruption. This is what Einstein stated. The point, however, is that um, these this, uh, this, uh, this equations are irreconcilably, irreconcilably incompatible with the electric, electromagnetic origin of the mass, demanding a first order, not one or ten to the minus fourth, a first order source tensor on the right hand side, as we will see in part two. So the very basic assumption is fundamentally flawed. 
and um, has not yet sur sur survived the test of time. And then you go to the, all the others. Then you have to select you know, a, 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 a metric. This is, you have a large variety. Look at this. <laughs> it's in, even in contradiction with, um, with the schwartz metric. metric. <laughs> it is just selected at all among a large variety. And rather than this, I won't select another solution. And then, <laughs> and then with covariance, you have an infinite variety of, of, of line elements you can select. And then after that, you have, the, uh, you have to select the geodesic. And then after that, you have to select this and this and that. After that, yes, indeed. After that, you represent curvature. But ladies and gentlemen, let's compare the, the, the power of the representation of the bending of light by Newton, Newtonian gravitation with this chain of assumption. There's no question in my mind that um, Newtonian representation is preferable because there, are no, <laughs> there is no assumption whatsoever. Everything is based on first principle without, uh, without assumption. At this moment, the, the, question, the, the, the correct question is then, uh, then why, do we have to, uh, why do we have to use curvature when, uh, when, um, when uh, Newton represents indeed in, um, uh, exactly the, the experimental evidence of the bending of light? Immediately, we'll say, oh, because there is the 45 seconds of the perihelion Mercurio, Mercurio, and other things, ladies and gentlemen. But um, we, don't, we don't have to represent 45 seconds of, uh, of uh, uh, Pariel, we have to introduce all sorts of a chain of, uh, of uh, continuous assumption and counter assumption, each of which is debatable and actually has been disproved. And, uh, and in any case, the, the, the 45 seconds of Pariel and other aspects have been um, represented by, by uh, the theories in a Minkowski space with an abyssal difference with the representation with Riemann, as we will see. Representation of those relativistic effects in, uh, in Minkowski space without curvature is invariant over time because it possesses the Poincaré symmetry. This has no invariance, it's a covariance. So the numerical prediction of 45 seconds is on a Polaroid uh, picture, as we will see in a moment. In conclusion, the, I have to conclude, to the best of my knowledge, that uh, the nu Newtonian uh, gravitation is preferable to Einstein gravitational, to the best of my knowledge, at this first stage. But let's keep going. Another historical objection, also totally unaddressed, is that um, the curvature positively cannot allow the representation of a fundamental event in gravitation, which is the free fall. The free fall of an object along a straight, straight radial line. Here is the Tower of Pisa, Galileo went on the top. To, of course, to, um, to, um, there was an historical test, for, um, not for gravitation, but well, for the gravitational constant. But in any case, the, 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 the already since uh, Galileo, we can see the, 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 the straight character. There is no possibility, ladies and gentlemen, to, to represent this, uh, this event with, um, with the uh, curved space, none. And uh, at this point, immediately they oh, but no, but we go into the geodesic, uh, geodesic, which is a radial line. Sure, but then, <laughs> of course you do, but then you have to kill the, you have to kill the curvature tensor. So you have to uh, annul the curvature, which is precisely the object. So um, this, this objection has to be matched with the preceding one that essentially established the, the uh, profound doubts on, uh, on the fact whether space is indeed actually, actually curved, in other words. It may, may be possible that the Riemannian uh, um, geometry, due to its magnificent beauty, can indeed represent gravitation in a very uh, elegant way. But the point, the fundamental point, persists, is that it does not necessarily mean that the space is actually curved. Even though the representation is magnificent from a mathematical viewpoint, it does not mean that space is actually curved. Think in this way. Not only the bending of light, but the idea of a curvature is associated with the trajectory of planets around, uh, around, uh, around the sun. But th that associating this trajectory with the curvature, ladies and gentlemen, is fundamentally flawed on any grounds and serious scientific grounds. That's basically Newtonian trajectory <laughs> of um, the equilibrium between the gravitational attraction and the centrifugal force. Um, the centrifugal force due to rotation positively, absolutely without any curvature wa of space whatsoever. Let's go to the, the next um, objection, the third uh, uh, out of a number of uh, historical objections. I've selected only three. Namely, the fact that we have a weight 
look at me. I'm, I'm heavy. See, I'm attracted by the hurt. And I feel this uh, weight without moving, without moving. Now, what is the problem? So the, what is the historical objection? Einstein, gravitation, cannot represent the weight of stationary bodies. This is essentially the, the objection, while Newtonian gravitation can. Ladies and gentlemen, I meditated on this for decades. I have to be, uh, I have to agree with the historical objection. And I found no possibility, no possibility to represent this fundamental additional, third additional gravitational point with Einstein gravitation. Ah, again, it may well be that um, I, my, my knowledge is insufficient. It may well be that Einstein gravitation represents the phenomenon. Yes, this, this is not the, the issue at, at stake here. The issue which is at stake is the unaddressed, unresolved, which means a profound disease, profound ethical problems in the entire scientific community on gravitation for one, in one century with a river, with the abuse of a river of money from the US taxpayer and taxpayers from other countries. The conclusion is that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, in regards to those fundamental events, I have to prefer New uh, Newtonian gravitation to Einstein gravitation. At best, if there is need of correction, definitely I will prefer relativistic corrections, namely corrections or enlargement or formulation of gravity in the Minkowski space and not in the Riemannian space for a variety of technical reasons that you will see uh, throughout this lecture. Most importantly, the lack of an invariance. Minkowski gives you Poincaré. The number that you pred uh, pre predict are invariant over, um, under the time evolution. With uh, Riemann, you have covariance which by, 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 by very definition, the numbers that you predict are not preserved in time. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I, 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 if I remain as being a physicist, I have to select the most plausible approach to the best of my knowledge and to the best of my capability. And that is abandoning the Riemannian formulation of gravity in favor of relativistic extension of the Newtonian gravitation, with the understanding that Newtonian gravitation already represents the virtual entirety, except for small cor relativistic corrections. But let's see the implications of uh, the lack of addressing of those issues. They are very serious. Whenever fundamental aspects in science are, are not uh, resolved, are not even debated because of purely political manipulation of the status of science, which is the, the, the precable condition, then there are consequences. Uh, that, uh, 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 gravitation is at the end of uh, directly or indirectly affect the entire knowledge. We're talking about Newton and we're, um, we're talking about the foundation of our knowledge. This one is... Uh, is um, um, is um, unbelievable at first sight, namely that the masses of all planets uh, and the mass of the Sun are uh, unknown on strict scientific grounds at this moment. Even myself, I do not know how to compute them. I repeat, it seems paradoxical that we do not know the masses of, uh, of Jupiter, of the Earth, of the Sun, uh, Mars, etc. Well, let's listen to the, uh, the, the argument first and then, uh, then throw judgment after the technical knowledge. But this you have to study some new mathematics to understand deeply this, this issue. Again, you have to remember that um, the source of the gravitational field is not the mass. Mass is a, is a parameter that uh, uh, we throw into the, the equation for, to, to express our ignorance. What is a mass? We don't know. The, 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 so the source of the gravitational field is the energy. So Newton's equations have to be written to be correct the way I've been doing for decades in terms of the energy, number one. Number two, the trajectories of the, of the planets in our solar system are known with extreme accuracy. They've been known with, uh, with great accuracy since the Mayan and the Egyptian uh, times. Now, what does this mean? 
This means that out of the extremely precise knowledge of the trajectory, we know the energies, the total energy of all the constituents of the solar planet with extreme accuracy. We know the total energy of the Earth, the total energy of the Sun, etc., etc. How do we go from this to the, to the mass? Through the equivalence principle, of course. But here is the point. The, the equivalent principle was formulated by Albert Einstein and confirmed experimentally for point particles moving in vacuum. Point particles moving in vacuum under which assumption indeed it is exactly valid. But the, the, the expansion, the extension of the same equivalence principle to a large body such as Jupiter or the Sun is a pure personal belief at this moment without any experimental evidence of support. For many, many reasons that we will study throughout these lectures, some of them are already studied in lecture 3a. For instance, for, um, the, the, if, we, uh, if we assume that, um, this, that this equivalence extends also to, the, um, to Jupiter, this automatically implies that, um, that in the interior of Jupiter, the speed of light in vacuum is also the maximal causal speed. In other words, we have to necessarily assume that the maximal causal speed in the core of Jupiter is the same as, same, um, um, the same as that for a point particle in vacuum. This is a personal belief, or just to pure theology. It may be right, it may be wrong. We do not know. We have to be careful if we want to be serious in science and separate what has been established and what is a personal belief. Here is, this is a, one of them. The extension of the equivalence principle to microscopic body, especially large body, is unknown at this right. As a matter of fact, this, this, um, this issue is at the foundation of the conjecture of the dark energy. Because dark energy is a consequence um, for the intention, intentional intent of maintaining the validity of the equivalent principle also for a black hole. But this implies that the maximal causal speed inside a black hole is the same as the speed of light in vacuum. We pass all boundary of uh, logic, of credibility, of serious behavior. We, in the interior of a black hole, we don't know what the maximal causal speed is. But then we don't know the equivalence, the equivalence uh, energy of that black hole. Once you accept um, deviation for large objects only from Einstein equivalence principle as done by the isotopy, isorelativity in lecture 3a, 3b, and 3c, then you, then you instantly remove any need of, uh, of uh, dark uh, energy in the universe and they have all sorts of additional implications.